includes uh, Job's kind of chapter three is is his uh, his lament, if you will, what's happened to him, and then the friends come in, and so we're going to hear from the friends in the dialogue between the three friends, comforters, and Job. So, the so-called friends. The so-called friends. The so-called <laughs> comforters. Yes. We use that term lightly. <laughs> Susan, Susan, will you come over there and stand beside him? I so I can get y'all all in there. I want to get all four of you in there. There you go. Perfect. All right. Are you who are you first? I think so. Are you ready? Yeah, we're ready. Curse the day I was born, and the night which said a man is conceived. May that day turn to darkness. May God above not look for it, nor light of dawn shine on it. That night, may it be barren forever. No cry of joy be heard in it, because it did not shut the doors of the womb that bore me. Why did I not die when I came out of the womb? And why was I ever put to suck at my mother's breast? Why was I not hidden? like an infant that has not lived to see the light. For then I should be lying in the quiet grave, asleep, in death, at rest. Why should the sufferer be born to see the light? Why is life given to people who find it so bitter? They wait for death, but it does not come. They seek it more eagerly than hidden treasure. Why should a man be born to wander blindly? hedged in by God on every side. There is no peace of mind or quiet for me. I shake in torment and have no rest. So I want to follow. <laughs> if one ventures to speak with you, will you be offended? Think how once you encouraged those who falter, but now adversity comes upon you, you lose patience. If, is your religion no comfort to you? For consider what innocent person has ever perished. Those who plow mischief and sow trouble reap as they have sown. A word stole into my ear in a vision. Someone stood there and I heard a voice. Can a mortal be righteous before God? Can human beings be pure before their maker? If I were you, I would make my petition to God and lay my cause before him. Do not reject the discipline of the Almighty. He wounds, but he also binds. Oh, that my troubles might be set on the scales. They would outweigh the sands of the sea. What wonder if my words are wild? The arrows of the Almighty find their mark in me, and their poison soaks into my spirit. Oh, that God would be pleased to snatch me away with his hand and cut me off, for that would bring relief. And in the face of unsparingly anguish, I would leap for joy. What end have I to expect that I should be patient? How shall I find help within myself? Devotion is due from his friends to one who despairs and loses faith in the Almighty. But my brothers have been as treacherous as the channels of streams that run dry that vanish the movement they are in spate. Dwindle in the heat and are gone. You felt dismay and were afraid. Tell me plainly. I will listen in silence. Show me where I have erred. Do human beings not have hard service on earth? Months of fertility are my portion? Troubled nights are my lot. My life is but a breath of wind. What are human beings that thou makest much of them? Only to punish them morning by morning, or to test them every hour of the day? Wilt thou not look away from me for an instant? Why dost thou not pardon my offense and take away my guilt? How long will you say such things? The long-winded ramblings of an old man. <laughs> Does the Almighty pervert justice? Your sons sinned against him. 
So he left them to be victims of their own iniquity. If only you will seek God betimes, if you are innocent and upright, then indeed will he watch over you. Inquire now of older generations, and consider the experience of their fathers. Can rushes grow where there is no moss, marsh? They will meet weather earlier than any green plant. Such is the fate of all who forget God. God will not spurn the blameless. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter. I know that no one can win a case against God. If anyone chooses to argue with him, God will not answer one question in a thousand. It is God who moves mountains, who by himself spread out the heavens, who does great and unsearchable things, marvels without number. He passes me by and I do not see him. How can I find words to dispute with him? If the appeal is to force, see how strong he is. Though I am right, he condemns me out of my own mouth. If only there were one to arbitrate between us. Don't condemn me. Tell me the ground of thy complaint. Thy hands gave me shape and made me. Dost thou at once turn and destroy me? Why dost thou bring me out of the womb? Will no one answer all this nonsense? <laughs> Is your endless talk to reduce people to silence? <laughs> If only God would speak and expound to you the secrets of his wisdom, can you fathom the mystery of the Almighty? He surely knows which, you, which human beings are false. If only you had directed your heart rightly and spread out your hands to pray to him. If you have wrongdoing in hand, throw it away. Then life will be lasting, bright as noonday. No doubt absolute wisdom is yours. But I have sense as well as you, yet I am a laughing stock to my friend, though I am innocent and blameless. Ah, if you would only be silent and let silence be your wisdom, is it on God's behalf that you speak so wickedly? He will most surely expose you if you take his part by falsely accusing me. I will take my life in my hands if he would slay me. I should not hesitate. I should still argue my case to his face. Let me know my offenses and my sin. Why dost thou hide thy face and treat me so as thy enemy? A human being born of a woman is short-lived and full of disquiet. Look away from me, therefore, and leave me alone. All right. Oh, well, no, oh, oh, there's, there's a we got to there's a little more. I think there's another way. I got to say something to myself. Sorry. <laughs> just a little more. If a tree is cut down, there is hope that it will sprout again. But a human being dies, disappears, never to be roused from sleep. If only thou was hide me in Shiloh till the anger turns aside. But now thou dost count every step I take. Every offense of mine is stored in thy bag. Thou hast wiped out the hope of frail humanity. Very good. We'll stop there. We'll stop there. Very good, very good. That takes us to chapter 14. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Hollywood's call. <laughs> well, I've got something here. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, um, where to begin, Job? Um, chapters 1 and 2, last week we looked at as this dramatic heavenly scene, if you will, and Satan, or uh, the adversary, the, the Satan, if you will, and God uh, were talking to one another, and we talked a little bit about that and some of the challenges of understanding some of the, that heavenly scene. But one takeaway we get is that Job is tested, right? He's tested in the process. And we talked about the fact that God uh, does test us. And he doesn't do it to, to make us fail. He does it to, um, to try us, to prove us that we might become more, more like him. And uh, this, week, this week we looked at Job's famous feature in chapter 3 which is just filled with all kinds of interesting things here. Um, and we'll get into that in a second. But um, this one has a lot of Hollywood lines to it, as Kevin is reminding us here. <laughs> like chapter 3, verse 3, Let the day perish on which I was born. That is quoted a lot. Uh, or verse 11, why did I not die at birth, come out from the womb and expire? Yeah. So this is a, a huge lament. Mm -hmm. And he's giving words to his immense grief, right? Mm -hmm. Immense grief. And so he's letting it all out, if you will. Now, we, we saw at the end of chapter 2, his friends had showed up, didn't they? Those last couple of <laughs> verses in chapter 2. Yeah. And they had remained silent for seven days. And uh, they, these three friends now are talking in chapters 4 and following. And, and Job is replying back and forth to them. Chapter 3, let's talk a little bit about chapter 3. The handouts that I gave you are about chapters 4 through 14. It's the dialogue. But let's talk a bit about chapter 3 and then we'll get into this, this dialogue back and forth. Job 3 is like a photographic negative. Remember the negatives when you take a picture? It's not the picture. It looks really strange looking, right? Uh, in fact, so chapter 3 is a lot like that negative. Um, it's the opposite of life lived under the favor and grace of God. Chapter 3 is, right? He's not living under what he, he knows as the favor and grace of God. Um, he wishes not only that he was dead. He, he doesn't just wish, in fact, he doesn't wish he were dead. What does he say? I wish I had never, ever, 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 ever been born. Right. So it's not like take me away, but God, could you rewind the whole script here <laughs> and just start over? Start over. And that we see in verses 3 and 11 here in chapter 3. And, and just as in chapter 1, verse 21, uh, it is God himself and God's grace that are the only things making life bearable for Job right now. And ironically, within the gloom, the glo this chapter is filled with all kinds of gloomy, gloom and doom. We hear an echo of how deeply Job loves and values God. That's the amazing thing to me, is underneath this, this man, this grieving man, is still an appreciation for God. And I think that's one takeaway we need to realize that Christians, if they are true believers, don't give up their faith typically easily. Uh, most of us don't. And that when we suffer, you're going to often hear a thread of their, even though it, it sounds dark and gloomy, they're, they're putting their trust you know, back in God. The only place they can put their trust in God, really, when we suffer. Uh, if we want true hope. You, you know, Michael, yes, there's, please. there's also, a, there's a time for lament. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's pushback on that. Mm -hmm. And there really is a time when that's called for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah anytime we're grieving, mm -hmm. yeah, there is an opportunity for a lament. That's mm -hmm. right. And I don't know that his friends obviously know how to process that with him. Right. We're going to get into that. These friends are not equipped. They're not equipped for his lamenting. So we'll see what we can learn from that. Um, Job's theology is 
quite pretty pretty robust here. A, a, a theology that allows for grief and lament is pretty robust. If you go around the world, <laughs> we're suffering. Not, I mean, we suffer here. I mean, there's immense suffering here. Don't get me wrong. But if you take away like a like a developing country, let's just talk about a developing country, okay? The the, the amount of suffering that's prominent is palpable, okay? And Christians who are living in these areas have really tapped into the, the, the idea of lamenting toward God, crying out to God. And if you think about our own culture, most of our good lamenting came from African Americans yeah. in, in terms of slavery. I mean, if you think about, like the good gospel hymns, mm -hmm. think about those good gospel hymns. There are a lot of them are laments. Mm -hmm. You know, God, through, God help me through my suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, and just really powerful, powerful songs, these, these old gospel songs are. So, so singing... Excuse me, Michael. Yes, please. One please. addition to that. Yeah. Like, so in Liberia, so when I was working there at the hospital, you know, it's very common, like if a child dies... The, the mom just throws herself down and screams. Yes. And, and that's very appropriate. I mean, that's, yes. you know, nobody that's gets their it. tradition. Yeah, I just. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Let's it out. Do what? Let's it out. Yeah. Yeah. Better to let it out mm -hmm. than to keep it in like right. we, we good Westerners do. Yeah. <laughs> we, we're real good at tidying this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the theology here is Job is hinting, though, that God is a little bit like a cruel slave master. Now, this is like Jesus on the cross. What did he say on the last one of the last one? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he's Jesus is crying out what he feels. Right? Same thing for Job. Look at verse 18 of chapter 3 here. There the prisoners are at ease. This is the ESV. There the prisoners are at ease together. They hear not the voice of who? The taskmaster. Task so in a sense, he's equating God here with God being a taskmaster. <clears throat> have you ever felt like God was a little bit like a taskmaster? <laughs> I have. <laughs> it's not good. It's not my best theology, <laughs> but it is theology, right? And it, and it feels that way sometimes when I've really been in hard places in my life. You know, and they're like, gosh, God, he, are you making it that hard on me? You know, to feel that way. He feels like God is hedging him in. Verse 23. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has what? Hedged in. What is he getting at here? God's hedging him in. What does that mean? He's being crushed and, and uh, restricted. Him. Restricted, yeah. yeah. Closer and closer and closer and closer. You know, you know, space, you know, if your space is being pushed yeah. in, you feel claustrophobic, yeah. you feel like there's no way out, right. right? And remember, Satan wanted to hedge him in. That's what Satan wanted to do. He says, I want to hedge this guy. You know, he, if you let me hedge this guy, I, he'll curse you. He'll curse you. Well, in chapter one, the hedge is seen as a positive, as a protective thing. Right. But here, it is definitely seen as a negative. Now he's, now he's turned it into a negative. You're right. Thank you. That's a good, good corrective point. Thank you. Verse 26. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble, trouble comes. This is a man who's, when you say, when I you know, give the blessing, may the peace of God, which passes, that's going to be hard for Job yeah. to take in. Mm -hmm. That's going to be real hard because he's suffering. He's suffering. And I think about that when I offer the blessing at church. I know many of you, you know, everybody's going through different things. Mm -hmm. So you all receive that differently, don't you, depending on what you're going through in your lives. Um, Especially but. when you can't sleep. You're, <laughs> you're not any good for anything or anybody. You know, <laughs> That's if, true. If, if it's so bad that you can't even sleep, then yeah. it's, it's really Physical hard, agony. Hard yeah, the physical uh, agony that we go face. On. Yeah. I like how when you give the blessing, you, say, you tell us to receive it. Yeah. Just receive it. Right. That's like helpful. It. Open up your receptors <laughs> yeah. as much as you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Open up your receptors. Wherever you're at in your life. Yeah. Well, 
that's, uh, I wanted to just say a couple of things, and I'll move into these responses, but um, I want to remind us as Christians um, how easily it is for us Western Christians to forget that there is spiritual warfare that goes on. Okay, this chapter doesn't deal a whole lot with that, does it? But in the New Testament, Paul especially, and Jesus too, uh, talks about that there are spiritual forces at work trying to harm us, right. trying to make our lives miserable. Mm -hmm. And we need to remember that, that there are evil forces of darkness that want to attack any kind of light that there is in God's creation. They're out to get any light because they want to make it dark. That's why we have the armor of God. Yes, so we can Ephesians chapter 6, that. that's right. And that's where we get the most prominent example of spiritual warfare that we have. That's right. Well, Job mentions a real... In the Old Testament, they didn't have a lot of language for this, but one thing they talked about was Leviathan. Uh, verse 8 says, Let those curse it who curse the day who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. I don't know if you thought about Leviathan a whole lot, but Leviathan is this crazy big creature that the Jews believed in. And they thought he was in the sea. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was a whale. I have no idea. Nobody knows. But he was a very, a very fearsome creature. Probably a whale or something. Who knows? Who knows? Godzilla. Godzilla. I, don't, <laughs> I don't know. But whatever it was, it was a fearsome creature. Because, you know, the Jews were afraid of the water anyway. So then you got a big creature coming out of there. And guess what? This is no fun. My point is that Leviathan... For them, represented darkness, chaos, disorder. Any kind of evil. Any kind of evil. And so he's representing their Leviathan represents often this uncontrollable evil. Now Job is going to wax eloquent, eloquently at the end of the book on Leviathan. He's got a whole chapter on Leviathan. Chapter 41, I think it is. And he's going to say, oh my gosh, God, you even created that. You know? And so... Hold the phone. God's in charge of everything, you know. So, but Leviathan was their way to talk about the uncontrollable dark forces in the world. And so Job is mentioning it here. It's mentioned in the Psalms, too. The psalmist will, some of the psalmists will mention Leviathan. Michael, I think it's, and maybe this is just my interpretation, who are ready to rouse up a little. It's like it's a sleeping giant. The Leviathan's up, you don't mess with it. Don't, don't poke him right. 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 or her. Could be her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you make of that, Kevin? Don't rouse Leviathan. Don't. Yeah, it, it's like it, it, Leviathan's there, but if, if you keep your, it, you keep if you if you stay on the right road, right, we won't rouse him. Right. So right. Keep your keep your keep eye on Christ. Keep away. Keep exactly. Keep, keep your away. thoughts as they should be, and your actions as they should keep be. Away from Leviathan. Right. Right. Exactly. It's always lurking. Yes. Yes. Amen. Last point in three, and then we'll move on to these other chapters, is weeping with those who weep, right? Weeping with those who weep. This is a key component of what we want to learn about weeping with those who weep. Um, and we're reminded that this is, this is all the time for us, the grief that's powerful. When we have loss, which is all the time, right? I mean, this is very prominent. Um, it, is, it is tempting when talking with someone in immense pain, to be overwhelmed and try to comfort ourselves by telling the sufferer that if only he would do something different. Have you ever, ever been there? Yes. Like, yes, Rob, you're being honest. Yes. That's good. Yes, and I, I, I want to say something before, but I want you to finish your point. Well, I'm just going to simply say <laughs> that if we're all honest, or at least I'll be honest with myself, that when you listen to somebody suffering, it's hard. It's hard to hard to feel that without thinking thinking different thoughts. You know, and I think it's part of just kind of holding space with them. Yes. And people yeah. just want to rush and we, do something. Because it fix it. Changes they things quickly. Fix it. Yeah. And we'll talk about the friends. They had no no place for waiting. That's just they just that does not compute for them. Robin, you want to say I just wanted to say that um, um, two things. One is that Job nor Jesus, when he said what he said on the cross, sinned. This is not a sin to talk this way. It is not a sin to voice that we feel forsaken. Right. And two, 
I really think the Christian church has failed miserably in allowing people space to just talk like this without judging. Yeah. We have been through intense grief in our own family. And if it wasn't for the 12 steps, and being able to voice that kind of pain in a non-judgmental, anonymous environment, yeah. we wouldn't have made it. Yeah. And it so we yeah. have a lot to learn. And, we do. And I'll, I'll just add to that. There's certain things that don't get talked about in the church mm -hmm. that cause immense pain. And people are suffering and don't feel like somebody can hold space yeah. in the church for them. Well, and it's why a lot of our younger people don't come. will not go to church. I mean, it's not the only reason, but a lot of them have a lot of deep pain and anguish that they don't know how to process, and they don't feel like the church is going to help them. Now, whether that's right or wrong, that's, that's debatable, but that's the way they feel, and that we're talking about the way people feel. Uh, uh, yes, Jim. Uh, Michael, I, I think a lot of the young people are, are have problems, especially the very young Mm -hmm. I heard uh, mm -hmm. someone even before puberty, they, they, they get on the internet and they, and, they, and they, you know, they come across some guy who's a real nut job and all of a sudden they get hooked on what he's saying and, and yeah. it messes them up. It messes them up. That's exactly right. And they have nowhere to process that messed upness. No, they can't. Mm -hmm. no, right. There they go. Yeah. So we got a lot to learn and that's what we're doing. We're asking God to help us as we process our own grief and learn how to process it with other people. Um, weeping with those who weep. Um, notice here that the friends who engage in this strategy here in the beginning of chapter 4 with the theology that's on your paper there. I want you to see their theology just a second. Oh, you got that handout here. Uh, just kind of jumping around a little bit. But you'll look in the middle of your paper. It says Job's friend's system. This is their system of belief these bullet points here. And so this kind of summarizes what you're going to hear from them. And, and kind of, I mean, there's some nuances to this, but this is kind of the, the nutshell of it all. Their system is this. God is absolutely in control. We have seen this, that this is indeed one of the foundational markers laid down by our narrator here in Job 1 and 2. Number two, God is absolutely just and fair. Everybody, everybody say amen, amen, right? <laughs> sure, of course. Therefore, it's the therefore is the problem. Therefore, he always punishes wickedness and blesses righteousness. Now, therefore, if I suffer, I must have sinned, and I am being punished justly for my sin. If I'm blessed, I must have been good. Although this isn't relevant here, so I don't develop this side of it here. That's not really going in. That's not the book, but that's that's part of the theology. Isn't that the current Islam? I mean, Jewish thinking. It is. It is. Well, it's a deep. It's a deep theology. It comes out of the Old Testament, right? It comes out. We call it. Uh, it comes out of Deuteronomy. If you do the right thing, you will be blessed. If you don't do the right thing, you will be cursed. cursed. So it's, it's, it's a core belief. The problem is that it's not nuanced. There's some nuancing to it. <laughs> that it's not a one-for-one one all the time as we see it in this world. Now, we know that throughout time that will be the case. That in the end result, that will be the case. But there's all these steps along the way before we get to be with Jesus that, that this doesn't always compute that way. What is the problem with the friend's theology as it relates to Job? What's the challenge here? Has Job sinned? Yeah, where was his wickedness? Yeah. Where was his wickedness? Yeah. But they're accusing him of that. Mm -hmm. Because why? They see the outward sign. Because they see the outward sign, the suffering. Right. And of course that makes him feel real good. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So... So that's that's the theology in a nutshell, and this is this is unfortunately it's it's really prominent in the church, and and and, and um, I know it makes Jesus weep. It makes Jesus weep because Jesus would have been called a sinner. In fact, Jesus was called a sinner, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. yep. He was called a blasphemer to God. Why was he typically called? 
You know, he did not have the life that looked so blessed, did he? Mm -hmm. His life did not look so blessed, but yet he never sinned. Jesus never sinned. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's part of the problem here. William Cowper, as I was saying his song tonight, one of his songs, he was a, a wonderful poet and hymn writer in the 1800s. Uh, his life was blighted first by the death of his mother when he was six. Uh, 53 years later, when his cousin sent him a portrait of his mother, Cowper, Cowper wrote a moving poem that makes it clear that his grief was ever fresh after 53 years. It included these lines about his mom. I heard the bell tolled on thy burial day. I saw the hearse that bore thee slow away. And turning from my nursery window, drew a long, long sigh and wept. Alas, I do. That's 53 years later for his mom. Of course, he, his mom died when he was six. We heard how Cowper's father sent him away to a boarding school where he was cruelly bullied in the, bull, in, the, in the boarding school. He probably never recovered in his mind from that. And then after a two year engagement, his fiance's father forbade the marriage. Before his conversion, he suffered repeated episodes of deep depressive illness. I was struck, he wrote, with such a dejection of spirits as none but they who have felt the same can have the least conception of. Day and night I was upon the rack, lying down in horror and rising up in despair. At age 31, Cowper suffered a catastrophic psychotic breakdown, tried three times to take his own life, and was committed to an asylum, what would now be a psychiatric hospital. An evangelical Christian ran the asylum, where six months later, Cowper met Jesus Christ and became his disciple. Describing his conversion, he wrote, Unless the Almighty Arm had been under me, I think I should have died with gratitude and joy. It was such a wonderful change and a real conversion in his life. And yet, four more occasions in his life, Cowper suffered deep, depressive illness after becoming Christian. And shortly before he died in 800, 1800, he was in deep despair when he died. And this, my friends, was a Christian. A real Christian. Boy, if anybody can understand Job, he could, couldn't he? Exactly. Exactly. He has bequeathed to the church some of its deepest and its greatest hymn. That hymn you sang tonight is from his heart about the Lord. And it was just, it's very moving. Oh, for a closer walk with God. This is a man in deep depression, right? In which he laments the loss of his blessedness he first knew when he first met Jesus. His diagnosis for his despair is that there must be an idol in his life. I must have done something wrong. I must Service. have done something wrong. Why, why, do I, why am I in deep despair? Right? I've, I've got to have an idol in my life. And if only he could be helped to tear that idol from God's throne in his life, then his walk will be close with God again, and calmness and serenity will return to his life. You hear those words in the song? I, I encourage you to listen to the song again later. And so the hymn is, as mu and as much, it applies to many of us as believers. It may be have written out of a false diagnosis of, of Cowper's own condition. That is, his despair might have had nothing to do with his backsliding or his turning away from the worship of a true God. For as we shall see in these chapters, Job's despair was not the result of backsliding or unforgiving sin. So that's, that's a bit of a background. Let's get into chapter 4 and 5 and 6 and, and just kind of make some larger points here with the time that we have. So you'll, you'll want this, this handout here. I want to just walk you through a couple of points here. Here's, here's what I'm seeing uh, with the friends, the comforters. And, and that is that the comforters, number one, are not impressed with Job. They're not impressed. But that's kind of an understatement. That's an understatement. Bildad, who, which one have you read Bildad? Susan. 
Susan, I'm sorry to tell you, but you clearly riled up, you were riled by Job. You said, how long will the words of your mouth be a great wind? Don't you love that? A great wind? <laughs> you get the point? You're blowing, you're blowing things, Job. You're a big blowhard, right? <coughs> why don't you shut, he says, why don't you shut up, you old windbag? You're talking a lot of hot air. Eliphaz, who was Eliphaz? It had to be Kevin, right? It had to be Kevin. Eliphaz uh, says much of the same. We, know we didn't get to chapter 15, but he says, let's just look at that. He, he talks again in chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. Look what Eliphaz says. You got that? Read it for us. Chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. Should a wise man answer with windy knowledge and fill his belly with the east wind? Should he argue an unprofitable talk or in words which, with which he can do no good? Yeah, 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 yeah. So again, you're you're blowing you're blowing wind, Job. You, you're 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 puffing, you're puffing, buddy. Um, his words are making them angry. His friends are mad. Yeah. Like, how dare you? How dare you talk like this? And what about Zophar? Look at 11 verses, chapter 11, verses 2 to 6. Zophar has his own upsetness. Someone read that for us. Chapter 11, verses 2 to 6. Should a multitude of words go unanswered and a man full of talk be judged right? Let me, through 6? Through 6. Should your babble silence men and when you mock shall no one shame you? For you say, my doctrine is pure and I am clean in God's eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips to you, and that he would tell you the secrets of wisdom. For he is manifold in understanding. Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. So, so Zophar, Zophar wants God to intervene and speak because that will shut Job up, right? He wants Job to shut up and stop babbling. It never crosses Zophar's mind that God might actually do this, let alone what God's verdict might be on him later on when they talk in chapter 42. And so the exchange continues. Job's friends become thoroughly fed up, thoroughly fed up with him, listening to him. We could go on and on. We don't have time, but there's all kinds of ways. They're just not happy with Job and the way he's talking. Well, the point number two. Job is not impressed with them. No, <laughs> okay? Not, no. it's, it's mutual. It's mutual here. The, the friends are not impressed. Job is not exactly filled with gratitude. Uh, the antipathy, the frustration are mutual here. Um, in, in diplomatic language, a full and frank exchange of views are taking place here. Job had hoped for refreshment from his friends. Uh, but they were like a riverbed to which a parched traveler turns aside only to find it dry as dust. He says that in chapter 6 in multiple ways. They're like, instead of having water, they, they, they make his life dusty, dry, dusty. Right? You with me? He says, miserable comforters are you all. <laughs> miserable comforters are you all. Chapter 16, verse 2. And he calls them windbacks. So back at you, he says. And wishes they would shut up. So not a lot of comforting going on either side here. It's not really working well on either side. And I think that's what the what the writer is really trying to get across. It ain't working. And Whatever they're doing ain't working. I just think it's interesting. It it takes a lot of the book. It's a huge part. It's, yeah, the, it's the it's the bulk huge. of the it's the bulk of the book. It's huge. The the dialogue is the bulk of the book. Mm -hmm. So you, it's like the point is made over and over and over and over. So, again. so why so much emphasis? <laughs> no, I think curious. I well, I think we all can surmise. Well, the, old, the old adage that when you go through a hard time, you find out who your real friends are. <laughs> right, we get that from Job. We actually get that that from Job. Yeah, that that expression. The point is that we're not good at suffering. We're not good at dealing with suffering. We're just not. So can we excuse the three friends earlier? Like so we don't have the discussion? Or <laughs> <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me, bye. 
No, I think the, you know by by going on and on, it's there's so many examples of things that you have said yourself. Yep. Being you know meaning well. Trying to help. Or you heard yourself, and it just was like pouring salt on the wound. So I think <laughs> it bears opening up 57 ways. Mm -hmm. It's criticizing instead of encouraging. Right. Over and over and over, over again. <laughs> yeah. Critical. You know, the word crit, you know, as a, as a former yeah. teacher, you know, we all, you know, students say, I'm going I'm to give you critical feedback. We know what critical means, right? Criticize. <laughs> we think it's totally negative because we use it only almost in a negative way. Where we word critical is to is to actually assess and to help. That's what the word critical is supposed insight. to be. insight to give insight. But we, we take it primarily as something negative. I just, I just want to throw in one more thing about the twelve step groups that um, you are not allowed to you you when you share you share your experience, strength, and hope. Right. Two, you're never allowed, you're not allowed to cross talk, you're not allowed to address what give somebody advice. else said. You can't give advice. And three, you're not allowed to give advice. And I guess four, then, when you share, no one else can talk. Like you, you don't dominate, but you share, no one else talks right. when you talk. Right. And uh, we could just do that for each other in the Christian community. There's been a lot, right, a lot, a lot yeah. written on that. Yeah. yeah. How can the church figure out a way to listen better when people are suffering? And just what, what can we learn from the 12-step groups, yeah. Well, anyway, anyway. Um, so he, he's, he's not getting comfort either. He's not impressed with them. <laughs> oh, yes, you are so wise. You are where wisdom is. When you die, I am really worried that there won't be any wise people left in the world. So <laughs> <laughs> a little sarcasm. <laughs> so Cutting sarcasm means cutting the flesh. He's cutting the flesh here. Um, so, back more. Third point. God is not impressed with Job's comforters. God is not impressed. The anger of Job at his friends is an echo of God's anger at them. And so, we are looking at these chapters, by and large, as a load of rubbish, as the Brits would say. Uh, except in a way, they're not. Because much of what they say would probably have us putting ticks on the market. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> right? Like Christine has Christina's just has said here. Uh, if they were total rubbish, that would make it much easier. But in fact, there's certain truths to what they're saying. All right? But it's not in the right framework. It's not in the right tone. And we'll talk about that in a minute. As we say, their system is all, I'm not going to do it again, but that's their system right there, okay? So you see their system. We call that a logical fallacy. You know, in, in, in the argumentative philosophy, when you say premise one, remember Swain in, in, as an attorney, premise one, premise two, well, does the conclusion equate from premise one and premise two? No. Their, print, their, their conclusions don't add up because they can't find the right... There's another premise right there. Perhaps there's another thing they need to be considered. And that's what's the problem here. All right. So that leads us then to another consideration here. And that is that their tone the friend's tone here. So you've got three points there on the handout. Three points. I want to emphasize their tone here. You ever go talk to someone on communication experts? You know, communication experts will tell you how your tone is really communicates as much as what you say. Right? With me? And, and often your body language, too, often communicates just as much, too. But their tone is not right. Uh, Eliphaz pulls rank on Job here, chapter 15, verse 9. What do you know that we do not know? We are senior to you, more experienced. Verse, verse 10, chapter 15, verse 10. For the friends, there is no puzzle in the world as they observe it. There's no mystery. There is no chink in their dogmatic armor. 
It is all tidy and so well swept. So why are they so confident? Why are the friends so confident? One is that they're not quite honest with themselves because they've inherited these dogmas and they're not prepared actually to look at the world as it actually is because God's truth fits with God's world. When we look at the world through the spectacles of God's word, the world comes into focus and makes sense. And so there is an air of unreality about their theology, if you will. It just does not fit the real world. It may work in a little tight Christian bubble when everyone agrees to believe it and does not look too closely outside, but it has no power and no persuasiveness for those outside. Again, if we have no room for someone who suffers innocently, then we've kind of missed the boat here. And, um, and so that's what they're, they, they cannot, what cannot compute. But, but just as importantly is they don't have sympathy for this man. How can you call yourself a comforter without sympathy? That's, that's just like comfort, sympathy. One of comfort, them, sympathy. One of them said, you haven't gotten half of what you deserve. I know. Don't you love it? I take it just the opposite because three of them came and they sat in silence for seven days. Mm -hmm. How many people do you know have done that? <laughs> Good point. Uh, Good point. I, they should have stayed. I, I saw a single time. 21 or 28 or 35. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I, I can't name anybody that would sit for me and not say anything for seven days. That's true. I agree. I agree with that. We talked about that a little bit last week, that there's a Jewish practice of doing that. I think it's, there's a lot of value to that, of, of sitting silently with friends for seven days. Can we say if they would have just kept their mouth shut? <laughs> <laughs> but no, the silence, I think, was probably helpful. I think for many people, sitting in silence with them is probably helpful. If you're with them when they're suffering, just being a presence for them is very, it's very comforting. Dress up and show up. Dress up and show up. I like that. I like it. Well, in their words, Wayne, their sympathy kind of it wanes a little bit. <laughs> no, no pun, no pun intended. No, no pun. Hey, Melissa, you're laughing. <laughs> I can't quite see why you should be so miserable, Joe. I can't quite see why you should be so miserable. Don't you love that? I, I, I don't understand why you're so miserable. You used to be the one offering comfort to other people. How could you not always have a smiling face? Joe, you ever, you ever been there? Like, I don't feel like a smiling face today. Um, I must admit, you were very good at it, Joe. Well, that wasn't so difficult when you weren't suffering. But now it's your turn, and you don't like it, do you, Joe? Chapter 4, verses 2 through 5. They are sorry for Job at the start, but they don't understand his pain. We, we, we realize how hard it is to help people when they suffer, okay? It's just really hard. Um, um, in fact, what happens oftentimes is we, speaking for myself, we get attached to our theories of what we think should work in suffering. Like, that's going to work. But oftentimes it doesn't, you know? And so, you know, I mean, I probably one of the most common things that people say, Christians say to other Christians who are suffering is, you know God is good. <laughs> God is good. <laughs> but saying at that time may not be as helpful to them at that moment. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Like, like the timing of it all, the way you're feeling, the way you're processing may not, may not help. Or like it's not as bad as it could be. <laughs> oh, yes. 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 Suck it up, buttercup. So we know these. We're, we're familiar with these. We've either done it or we've had it done to us, as Christine was saying. Their love, I, I don't want to say that they're loveless, 
But love, love is willing the good of another person. Yes. That's what love is. Love is willing the good of that other person, right? Willing the good. And so their cycles of speeches are like dialogues in which one side are deaf to the cries and protestations of the other person, right? They don't respond to what Job says and engage with him as a fellow human being in need. And it has been said that we can only understand what we love. The, the sympathy thing, I guess I've got a lot to learn, don't I? The sympathy oh, thing that no. has so much, and then it's yeah. time to move on. Is there anything in there about the time? Because I, I, I was convicted of that because I've been guilty when people have, and I can grieve and I can be sure. a comforter, but years later, when yeah. they're still dealing with that, I, like you, is kind of like, okay, can we move on? Well, but you just talked about that guy who 53, 53 years, years yeah. later. Right. Is there anything? Is it a well, tiny think, thing? Bill, you want to say something? Yeah. That's a good question. I think... When somebody has a problem, mm -hmm. it's a particular roadblock in their life. Right. We have roadblocks in business, in life, and in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. One of the problems that you find out about people in their thinking is they may think of an answer, or they may have an idea, but they don't know how to implement it. Right. They don't know how to make it happen. And I think when you find somebody with a problem that's stuck, as opposed to saying, well, I gotta say, get off your backside, move, or, or whatever you wanna do. You have to help them, and I think it's an encouraging factor to find a way to implement to get out of that situation. And so what you do is you ask a lot of questions. They start to think, they start to get out, and, and you start to get out of that roadblock that you're in. None of us can cure anything and everything all the time. So when you hit a roadblock, what you need from other people through friendship and love, which we've been asked to do, is to try and help them implement whatever it is to cure that problem. And we don't ever do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, it's sharing whatever you have with them to help get them farther down the road. And if you don't have it, go find somebody that will. Yeah. But it's... it's a lot of people are frustrated in life because they can't implement what's bothering them mm -hmm. to get out of it. Yeah. And I think it has to come from someone else. It has to come from a group. It has to come from whatever. And offering that encouragement to help get out of that <coughs> and, and, and find a way to talk about it. Maybe you can't, but you gotta try. You can buckle up and move on. It doesn't work, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, that's you know that. You still do it because right. that's kind of the way you are. Way but, talk, yeah. but it does. You, you know also that it doesn't work. Exactly. Well, and it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to tell them something that's going to be able to implement. Yeah. But I found when people are really frustrated, a lot of times they don't know how to implement their way out of something to cure a problem, and. So it's helpful to try and ask questions or encourage. Mm -hmm. but, but I don't think in this situation, Job was asking his <coughs> friends to do a five point, you know, plan on making his life better. Mm -hmm. He just wanted someone to sympathize with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think he was still new. It's kind of like what you said about the lady with the baby. I think he was still in the midst of yeah, it. He, sure. There needed to be that time yeah. of no judgment and grieving yeah. and truly, and I think a lot of times as a, in America we we hold a lot of that we don't grieve. We're so busy. You've heard of these people that say they're so busy with the funeral and whatever they don't grieve until later. Right. Right. I, I think there is healing, like you were saying, in that grieving process. And then it's followed by what we <laughs> Well, we got a lot to learn. <laughs> we got a lot to learn. <laughs> you want to say that, Larry? Yeah, but it's, and you know, is he actually asking for a solution even at that time? Mm -hmm. 
maybe not. Um, so it's like your adult kids, you know, uh, unsolicited advice is criticism. Um, you know, so if you say, well, gosh, why are you sad? This is what you need to do. That's perceived as criticism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It actually is. <laughs> is, is, is every, go ahead. I, one other thing that you said, I, I was thinking what Bill said. I'm not bragging, but we've lived around the world, right? Yes. And, and we've seen a lot of things. Sure. And I just, it's just my opinion that, that everybody around the world and third world or wherever isn't suffering. They don't have time to suffer. They want to live, and they and they so they're looking yeah. for the suggestion of how do I live. They don't have time to sit there and wallow in, in their situation. Yeah, sure. I think I think it would almost be only those of us that have a good life and and, and think about about that kind of stuff rather than trying to find a, a solution. And it's also what we think is suffering and what they think is suffering, maybe. But uh, but that's that's another aspect of it. I, I don't know. Well, thank you. Uh, let's, let's land this plane, as they as they say, as we get close to the end of the road. And it's 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 a conversation because you know there's a lot all of us can learn. I mean, I mean, you know. Um, and and the last thing I want to mention is those three things. I think these three guys don't have a real theology of Satan, of the evil one. That does not compute really with their theology. They don't have theology of waiting, of patience, and how, to, how what's the proper timing to say these things. Um, even though they waited seven days. I, I get that. I get that. I get that. But apparently when they do rush in, they've still apparently not waited long enough. Right? And they don't have, and this is the most important point I can make tonight, they don't have a theology of the cross. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's, the cross hasn't happened. Right. It hasn't happened. And there are people today that have had the cross happen, they still don't have a theology of the cross. Yeah. And what do I mean by too that? Many. What does that mean? They don't have a theology of the cross. They don't know Jesus. Even good people suffer. Even the good, even the most innocent person yeah. can suffer. And so uh, when you look at Jesus on the cross, he looks like a criminal. But he wasn't. <laughs> anyway, so may God help us. Uh, we want to help people. We want to encourage people along the way. And Don, you're right. We've got we to find the best ways. We're all trying to learn what, what that is. I would say that if we, we consider ourselves not good at this, then we say less, <laughs> and we invite people that are good at this to come with us. And, uh, you know, we don't have to do this alone. We, you know, maybe they should have brought their wives. <laughs> I mean, I'm being serious. I'm being serious. Maybe that was, I don't know. But something, they need to learn something. We do too. So, <laughs> anyway, I'll shut up there. <laughs> but God, God is good. And he's, in, he's with you during your suffering. And, and he's with, in fact, that's the cross. And it's, thank you. Go ahead. Well, I mean, isn't what Job, and I, some of this, I, that's what I picked up from um, Bible project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the whole book is about suffering, yep. and how how can we handle suffering, right. and do we remember that God is still with us in our suffering? Exactly. Right. And the cross, Amen. we remember that with the cross, because right. even though Christ said, "My God, my God," he that was a that was a plea of passion, because in the psalm itself, he knows that God is actually with him, even though he feels. Like God is forsaken. He knows God is with him. And we have to remember that. Even as we cry out to God, we can remember that. So thank you, Sherry. That's a good good point to end on. I like that. All right. Uh, let's see. It's only a few minutes till, so we will not play compline tonight. Uh, would someone like to close us out in prayer tonight? Who's feeling so well tonight? Anybody? Well, I will if nobody feels so well. So. All right. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are with us, as Sherry just said. That you are, uh, through your son Jesus, there is always a closeness that we have. Whether we, whether we realize it or not, you're, you're there with us. And you have suffered far more than we'll ever suffer.
And although that doesn't always make us quote unquote feel better, it is, Lord, it is the truth that we can cling to even as we as we do go through hard times in our lives. And we confess tonight, we, we need to confess, Lord, that we can grow in this area, not just at Christ Anglican, but as your church at large. And so we just lift up your church to you, O Christ, our fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord, that we would be a comfort, a true comfort, a true encouragement to people who are, who are going through hard times in their lives, that they might be able to, to cling to you in their time of, of need. We ask, Lord, that you will send us forth tonight, Lord, just to do the work you've called us to do, and may we just experience more of your transforming love in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Go peace.